What's up, Dr. Alexis Cowan? Hi, good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you actually really need um, no introduction to my audience, but I'll introduce you anyway. So you are an amazing dear friend of mine. You graduated from Princeton with your PhD in out of actually Rabinowitz's lab, Josh Rabinowitz, who is uh, world famous for metabolomics. And you're a very good scientist and Thanks. just very smart. You're like the, the savant. And we were, we were joking before. Um, I very rarely see you super fired up. <laughs> and uh, she's super fired up. She sent me this paper and she said, this is ridiculous. This has gotten so much press. We have to talk about it. And this paper, this is the diet. So this paper was um, published in Nutrients. Dietary protein restriction improves metabolic dysfunction in patients with metabolic syndrome in a randomized control trial. You're like chomping at the bit. Just I, I can see it in your eyes. So just take it away. Just take it away. Sure. So I guess I'll start by describing the study a little bit for context, and then we can kind of dive into some of the details of their findings. So <laughs> um, the study was conducted in Brazil from 2017 to 2018. Um, it was only a 27-day study, so I think that's important to identify, like, the interventional period is quite short. Um, and essentially, the researchers had two groups. Um, one group was calorically restricted, so they were receiving 25% less calories. Uh, they basically assessed their, um, their energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry so that they could assign, uh, like, an approximately 25% caloric deficit to each person based on their own, like, metabolic rates. Um, this group had a macro split of 50% carbs, 30% fat, and 20% protein. And then the second cohort was a protein-restricted group. So they were intending to receive uh, an isocaloric diet, meaning they were going to be eating at caloric maintenance. So eating enough calories every day to maintain their weight um, throughout the study period. And their macro split was slightly different, of course, because they had the protein restriction. So they received 10% protein uh, by calories. 30% fat, and then 60% carbs. Um, and then, so the one thing that really stuck out to me at first was uh, in their anthropometric data, you know, looking before and after the study, they showed that um, the protein-restricted group lost a significant amount of weight. So if you look at um, statistics-wise, like on a, on a graph, if there's one asterisk above a data point, it will mean it's statistically significant, so p-value of less than 0.05. Yeah. And they lost a significant amount of weight, not as much as the calorically restricted group, but pretty close. And then both groups lost a significant amount of fat as well. And maybe to the lay person reading this, they wouldn't see a problem. It's like, oh, amazing. You know, the protein restricted group lost weight and lost fat without restricting calories. Like, hallelujah. <laughs> right. Uh, that's uh, not yeah. exactly what happened. But in fact, the fact that they lost weight indicates that they were not isocaloric meaning that they were actually eating below maintenance, and whether that's because they weren't finishing the food that they were provided. I don't know if protein-restricted food tastes worse. I don't know the logistically what the problem was, but the fact that they lost weight um, during the, the study period indicates that there's basically a confounding variable because now both groups are calorically restricted, and you can't directly compare them because they're not isolated variables anymore. Mm. So that kind of taints the rest of the data in my view like you, we can still obviously look at it but because they lost weight they're also calorically restricted which means a lot of the benefits they see could be from that caloric restriction and not from the protein restriction did it also talk about the quality of the weight loss so they did some secondary endpoints uh, they looked at body composition just using a bioelectric impedance um you know obviously there can be some issues with and also 27 days is very short very short yeah, they looked at, I mean, that's some of their primary endpoints. They looked at, like, HbA1c. They looked at uh, lipids. But we know, like, any dietary change can result in pretty dramatic changes in lipids in the very short term. Right. But in the long term, it can be completely inconsequential. What are some other problems with this study? Why has this got you so pissed off? <laughs> well, primarily because <laughs> I can't believe it passed peer review with such a glaring problem mm. in that their supposed isocaloric group is not isocaloric. And it's like, how are we supposed to interpret this then if both groups have the same variable? Like, we have to have separate groups that have, like, um, like unique identifying isolated variables in order to put them head-to-head -head and say, oh, this had this effect while this other group, you know, this had this effect. We're not able to do that anymore. 
um, because of you know whether it's some logistical issue in implementation or in study design it's hard to say um, it seemed like their their premise going in was fair but for, for whatever reason it wasn't implemented properly and I don't know why that might be mm. um, but it's a serious problem in actually taking the study seriously and and considering the data um, in an objective way it's not really very easy to do that when we have these two groups that are um, kind of confounded do they mention that in the uh, discussion no so actually they they tout the protein restriction as being like amazing because they are isocaloric and yet they're still losing weight and losing fat hmm. like that's one of their primary findings that they're like touting could it be that it's creating some kind of methionine restriction that's causing some kind of um, stress response like an increase in metabolic rate yeah so I would I wouldn't think it's likely because we know that dietary protein actually increases metabolic rate slightly because of the thermic effect of food right. so if anything we would expect a slight decrease in metabolic rate mm -hmm. not an increase especially in like the short-term study um, you know in the longer term I think it's I think protein restriction is interesting and like I'm not inherently against this paper because it has to do with protein restriction. I think there's a time and place for it. Probably. But it also got a lot of press, and exactly. it got a, a lot of uh, somewhat unfair press if this this paper is not well done. And exactly. They don't also address a mechanism of action as to why the protein restriction, if in fact, um, why they actually lost weight. Yeah, and, and they they showed that like lean mass remained the same in both groups to a certain extent. I think the calorically restricted group, they reported a small loss in lean mass, if I remember correctly. Um, but the odd thing about this is that um, they also instructed all the participants within the study to not exercise because they didn't want to induce exercise as a confounding factor because it can't really be normalized across individuals if they were to just engage in like whatever So how would that exercise. make sense? How would an individual maintain on a Right. I, I suppose it depends on the age, but... It's confusing. How would someone be able to maintain that? And are you familiar with any of the scientists in the study? No, not at all. I, uh, they're from they're from Brazil, so um, this wasn't conducted in like a... Not that it matters necessarily, but I'm not uh, personally familiar with them. Mm. Anything else that you want to say? I, are you seeing um, a lot of people talking about the study? Yeah, so I initially saw it. Somebody sent it to me from examine.com. They posted it on their Instagram, and it was, like, very, very popular mm. because I think it's somewhat contrarian. Mm. Though I could be biased because I'm very immersed in, like, a protein-forward <laughs> community. Uh, you better be. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. and personally, that's, like, a lifestyle that I prefer to follow most of the time. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, I think there's a time and place for protein restriction. But I think this is kind of, like, um, within the vegan or, like, vegetarian wheelhouse. Like, they're... I don't know if they're going to be citing this as like, look at look, look right. at this paper, like look at these results, but we'll see, I guess, over time um, as, you know, time passes where this paper lands. And, but if it's used as like solid data to support an argument, I, you know, I would argue that the people who are using it aren't actually reading the study and analyzing it because if they were, they would see that there's major, major pitfalls here. Anything else within this uh, paper that stuck out of you? I mean, we kind of already discussed it. Like, the primary endpoints, lipids as a primary endpoint, maybe aren't necessarily that relevant. I wonder why there are people are still um, using that in, in such a short-term study. I mean, listen, yeah. I, I think that LDL is can be an issue, depends on the person. Um, yeah. But again, using that as a, for example, um, maybe a triglycerides would have been a better marker. I think they included yeah. they included they did. trigs. They did like all the standard lipids, HDL, yep. CLDLC. They didn't look at LDLP. They um, just looked at LDLC and triglycerides. They looked at HbA1c. Um, something interesting that they saw is, you know, HbA1c also went down in the protein restricted group, even though their calories from carbohydrates were increased by 10%, and they weren't exercising, and they were supposedly isocaloric. So you wouldn't necessarily expect that. Yeah, that's that is strange. But that's what I'm guessing. Like the HbA1c effect was actually from the uh, unintended caloric restriction. Hmm and not from the protein restriction per se, because they're eating more carbs, there's more glucose around, they're not gonna be clearing it as quickly because they're not moving, like they're basically in a, meta not a metabolic ward, but they're in like an enclosed setting within the hospital. Mm. So all their meals are controlled, everything is provided to them, so it's not based on reporting. Um, so that was kind of, that's a, uh, a great aspect to the study actually. Yeah. If it was implemented properly, it's, it's well, 
much more well controlled than a lot of like the reporting studies in the diet space. Do you have a percent of uh, grams in terms of what the actual grams of the, the diet was? Do you have that? Yeah, so 50 grams of protein in the protein restricted group and about 71 grams of protein in the calorically restricted group. Okay. So they're actually both s- pretty similar. They're okay. not that dissimilar. Um, so I, rem- I remember now but when I was doing those calculations that I was surprised they didn't make more of a dramatic difference between the two. Um, and how many carbs were in the high carb protein restricted group? In the protein restricted group, it was 60% of calories from carbs. So, you know, that's roughly like just over a thousand. And then. So that's over what? So that it was about 300 grams of yeah. carbs. Yep. So that's double the RDA. Yep. Recommendation. Yep. And also they, in their intro, they made a, a claim that I found to be quite unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And that was that the Western <laughs> diet is approximately 1.5 grams per kilogram protein. Yeah, no. No, No, it's actually not. No, and they said that a low protein would be 0.8 grams per kilogram, but that's like average in the West. So I don't know where they're getting these numbers. Hmm. Um, So all in all, would this have passed your peer review? (laughs) Uh, No. (laughs) (laughs) Denied. Uh, Denied. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Dr. Alexis, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, clearing this up for people because I know this is going to be uh, Twitter worthy. Yes. And um, it's just really helpful to have someone who had a primary job and responsibility to be reviewing and reading literature come in and say, okay, well, these are some major glaring problems. Even if this was published in a peer review journal, what are the questions that we need to ask? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to come do this anytime. I love reading papers and analyzing them. So let's keep doing it. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thank you.